something else that contributes to patterns of social inequality, quite obviously, to use a much more specific term, is income. Income refers to something completely different than the much more general idea of wealth. We don't really need a definition of what a person's income is. It's how much money you make within a given period. So how much you make a week, a month, a year, etc. In this discussion, the text brings up inflation. And you know you're getting older when you start saying things like, when I was your age, that only cost one dollar or something similar. And I have found myself saying things like that. Inflation is important to keep in mind because if you just look at how much the average Canadian's income has risen over the years, it looks pretty positive. Until you have to take into account that expenses have also risen. My mom has told me more than once that the first house she and my dad ever bought was just under $3,000. $3,000! But that was in the late 1950s. So yes, across the board, the average income people earn has risen, but at the same time, inflation has risen as well. When I went to college in 1996, the tuition for the whole year was $999. Um, tuition now for the same program is 4000 for the first year and 3900 for the second year. And I've wondered more than once and continue to wonder, what will tuition be by the time my son gets to university age? And frankly, at that point, will it be worth it for him to be university educated? considering how much it will cost to get the degree compared to earning potential. Now I'm going to get more specific again because we need to look not just at income and inflation but at the distribution of income in our society. And what I mean by that is how the financial situation for a person or family has changed or stayed the same based on their socioeconomic status which determines your social class and in addition, if the amount of change has been the same between social classes. So in other words, has the amount of inequality between the lower and upper class remained the same? Have differences between the lower and upper class remained the same, same or grown larger? Are there more people in the lower working class now compared to 60 years ago? Are there more people in the middle class? And remember, we are talking specifically about income only. So in Canada, as in most developed countries, the income gap between the upper and lower class has widened. It has grown larger over the last 30 years. The difference in income between the poorest and the richest has grown. I am reminded of the old saying, that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Um, it's a pessimistic kind of saying, but at the same time, this is essentially what has happened. And this has happened, even though specific efforts have been made by our government to distribute wealth more equally. So in Canada, we have the child tax benefit and GST credit and unemployment insurance. All of these programs contribute to keeping the gap between the working and upper class from widening as much as it would have if it had been left on its own. Now what this means is that Canada is a welfare state and this term tends to be thrown around quite a bit in my experience usually referring to something in a negative way. A welfare state simply means that the government of whatever country tries to equalize inequality, to lessen inequality by positively contributing to an equitable distribution of wealth. So the government tries to protect the well-being of its citizens, the health of its citizens, their economic well-being. The government of a, wealth, of a welfare state, such as the Canadian government, does this by transferring funds from the state to certain social structures, certain social services like health care or education. And at the same time as it transfers funds directly to individual, in the form of benefits such as the child tax benefit or employment insurance. And the government has the money to do this because of taxation. This is, this is in part what our taxes go toward. So those who support the concept of a welfare state, the practice of it, argue that it helps reduce the income gap between the rich and the poor. On the surface, just with that pretty simple explanation, I don't think anybody would have much of an issue with a welfare state 
providing assistance to somebody who needs it. But it's not quite as simple as that. Now, everybody's entitled to their own perspectives, their own opinion. And some people absolutely oppose either the basic concept of a welfare state or the practice of it, feeling that there should be no assistance provided at all, or that there should be a lot less assistance provided and that the manner in which it's provided needs to be seriously updated. For example, some people argue that providing social programs and benefits actually discourages people from working, that it encourages the sorry, encourages them to adopt a handout mentality and to rely more on these programs instead of trying to improve their lot in life. Some people who are opposed to a welfare state feel that no personal responsibility is put on recipients for decisions they have made leading to their poorer economic situation. So they feel that people need to be held accountable and responsible for the decisions they make. And if they do something negative, or don't do something they should, then it isn't up to the rest of us to always bail them out. That a person may benefit from these programs and continue to be irresponsible and make poor choices, should they con continue to receive assistance. The stereotypical example of this is a family that already has four children living on social assistance and the mother becomes pregnant again, and a few years later pregnant again when you have families with people working full time who make a conscious decision not to have more children and they take steps to ensure that doesn't happen. So some who support the concept of welfare state don't think it should be eliminated or stopped altogether, but that the regulations in place for people who receive assistance need to be changed, putting more of a time cap on how long a person is eligible. Um, if somebody has a child, they don't receive an increase in assistance benefits. If somebody has a child, a much more radical approach, that the infant should be removed and placed for adoption because obviously they're not responsible to look, to look after themselves and we're not responsible enough to not get pregnant. So whether you personally agree with the concept of a welfare state or not, these are valid points. They might be politically incorrect. They might strike a nerve. They might not be gentle but they are valid points and they do have support from a portion of the public. And again, people are entitled to their own opinion whether you agree with it or not. So, let's backtrack just a little bit and look at how this happens. Apart from what kind of economic circumstances a person is bor born into, why is it that some people have so much while others have so little? How can we explain how income is generally distributed in society? Looking past the obvious fact that income is unevenly distributed because some people make more money and some people, people make less money. So some people are able to earn a much higher income, obviously, based on their occupation. Certain jobs pay more than others. Some people work more hours than others, and therefore they earn more. Some people are naturally gifted in some way. Maybe they're natural athletes or mus musicians or dancers or artists. And this leads them into an occupation where they do very, very well for themselves. At the same time, some people are not only not born with natural talent, but instead some kind of genetic difficulty. Whether they have a physical or mental disease, some kind of handicap. So whether born with an overabundance of talent or with an unfair overabundance of difficulties. These are extreme examples. These are the ones you really don't see very much. And instead, the vast majority of us are just ordinary, everyday people. There's nothing noticeably special about us, no matter what your parents told you. And the genetic lottery has little effect. Without a doubt, however, we know that for most people, because of the way our society is currently structured and the manner in which it operates, that education has become increasingly important in regards to how income inequality has developed. Education is a significant contributor to income inequality, and it continues to become more and more important as our society has changed and evolved. Canada is based on a knowledge-driven economy. 
when we first became a country, our economy as a whole was largely based on natural resources. Agriculture, lumber, hunting. And this is why we have a two-month summer break, two months off all at once during the hottest months. Because historically speaking, children were needed to work as labor on their family farms. Their parents really could not afford to not have them working full time. So during planting and harvesting periods, children would miss a lot of school and in the summer when these crops needed tending. So even though agriculture is no longer the backbone of Canada's economy, this two-month summer break has remained and likely will remain for a long time to come, just because we're so used to it. Now in some parts of Canada, year-round schools have been established. And in a year-round school, students have the exact same, or no, same number of holidays every year. They have the exact same number of school days, but they're redistributed. So instead of having this two-month chunk off all at once, that's distributed more evenly throughout the year. As Canada industrialized, modernized, suburbanized, the level of education a person did or did not have took on more and more significance. So in the 1950s, for the first time ever, a grade eight education became standard. It became the norm, meaning that it was unusual if somebody didn't finish at least grade eight. In the 1960s, a high school education became the typical minimal level of education. In fact, it was in the 1960s that the term high school dropout first emerged because prior to the 60s, it was not assumed that pretty much everybody would graduate from high school. In the 1970s, educational norms progressed further to include a college education. In the 80s and 90s, a three-year university degree became the norm, then a four-year degree. Now, it's usually a four-year degree in addition to something further, whether that's graduate school or teacher's college or somewhere else. So we have an economy that is a knowledge economy based on the production and management of knowledge and because of that, we as Canadians now invest in ourselves much more than ever before. We kind of view ourselves as a place to invest, trusting that it'll pay off at some point in the future with a good occupation, a higher income, and everything that usually goes along with that. This is human capital theory. Investment and training and education in the skills and abilities of people to increase productivity. And this is what you're doing right now by taking this course. By furthering, by furthering your education, you are investing in yourself, trusting that there's going to be a payoff in the future and that you will benefit from this investment at some point in the future. The fact is more and more jobs require more and more qualifications. I usually refer to early childhood education as an example of this. It used to be that you didn't have to have further education past high school in order to work at a daycare. Some did, but it wasn't necessary. But these days, it's unlikely a person will be hired to work in a daycare unless they have some kind of qualifications, an ECE diploma or a certificate in child development or something similar. I've taught intro, intro soc and intro psych um, at Canador for several years, first by correspondence and then online. And for a little while there, I routinely would have women over the age of 35 taking these courses because although they had been working in daycares for 15 years or more, all of a sudden they wanted uh, to get their ECE diploma in order to keep their job. They had to upgrade. So they invested in themselves. Um, so there's a definite and direct link between education and income. That will come as no surprise. But in addition, the importance of education and the necessity of it has risen steadily. The link be between schooling and income has become stronger. It's the same for teaching. It used to be, believe it or not, that you would finish high school, complete one year of teacher's college, and voila, you were a teacher, no BA needed. Now, a three-year university degree is often the minimum required for a potential employer to even look at your CV, whether you're looking for a job or in another area. And in addition, teachers are constantly taking AQ courses, additional qualification courses. 
um, to maintain their CV. So we know that this significance, the importance of having further education has grown enormously. It's a major source of the unequal distribution of income in Canada. But it's not the only source of unequal distribution. I want to mention something uh, that I talked about previously in other chapters, and that is social ca capital and cultural capital. So, sorry, just before we go on to that. So if you look at this graph, um, it shows age group and employment income. And as you can see, the more education somebody has, the more money they are likely to make. And yes, this is Canadian. I have just as much difficulty as students do finding Canadian sources, but this is Canadian. Okay, so social, cultural, and, cap and cultural capital. So remember, social capital refers to the networks or connections that individuals possess. I talked about the strength of weak connections in a previous class, so that you're actually more likely to find work through your weaker social connections because your social networks are not likely to overlap as much with this person. Social capital is who you know, who can put a good word for you in for a job, who can maybe even help you get an interview for a job. All of these are social connections that a person can directly benefit from. It's the power of social relationships, social connections, social resources. Have you ever known somebody who got a job because of who they knew? They had a relative working there, somebody to put a good word in for them, somebody who could give them an informal reference off the record. This happens all the time, a person making use of their social network, which entails making use of these social relationships and social connections. This is one of the main reasons why, in regards to supply teaching, there is now in many districts an automated system for calling in supplies or a must follow list that specifically states the order have to be called in because previously only certain people were getting work based on who they knew while others were getting virtually none. Um, and I've had many people talk to me about this. So you'd have a teacher in a school they have a family member or the son or daughter of a friend who had just graduated from teacher's college and wouldn't you know it, that person would be called into that school all the time. And meanwhile, there's other people waiting on the supply list who are getting virtually no calls. So in order to combat this problem of cultural capital providing an unfair advantage, many districts now have these automated call machines or must call lists. So. Social capital refers to networking. So it's not just passing on a good word for somebody. It also refers to networking in terms of making use of somebody's personal knowledge or making use of the experiences they've had. So for example, let's say somebody is going to be a teacher. If you know somebody who's already gone the teacher's college route, who's already gone through getting into teacher's college, what they found was worthwhile to take in their undergrad, somebody who's gone through getting placements, getting along with placement teachers, somebody who has gone through the whole evaluation process, um, who has gone through looking for that first teaching job and the stress involved with all of that, they can pass along their knowledge resources to you, their social capital their personal relationships, their experiences, compared to somebody who doesn't have the benefit of that. This would help you make better decisions in terms of what you should do, more informed decisions, perhaps more importantly, what you should not do. They might advise you what courses you should or shouldn't take in your undergrad, um, what's really worthwhile or not worthwhile in terms of additional qualifications, or volunteer work to beef up your CV. They would be able to advise you how to really score bonus points in your placements with your associate teacher or the principal. And all this means that you're making use of social capital that somebody else might not have. It provides you an advantage over other people. When you look at first generation university students, 
And by that, I mean students who are the first person ever in their family to attend university. The same is also true. If you have family members who have attended university before you, they can provide you guidance and advice. Not just when you're in university, but leading up to it. This is what you should take in high school. Um, they can advise you on the application process for university. And I mean, I'm just thinking of this. When I went to graduate school, I went to Western down in London. And my brother had already gone there for um, his PhD. And we're not in the same area. He's in history. But at the same time, just having somebody who had experience with the city and experience with the school I was going to, it also helps to alleviate a lot of stress. I mean, even just somebody to walk you around campus and show you around so you're not, you know, as my son would call it, looking like a noob stumbling around campus because you're one of the new people. So this is all social capital. 